Welcome to From the Valley Podcast with your host, Tim Wilshere. Yeah, welcome along everybody. It's episode 41 of From the Valley Podcast today, Monday, the 15th of April 2019. Great mate of mine, Thingy, Chris Morahan. Welcome along to the podcast. G'day, Tim, mate. Good to be here. Thanks, mate. Thanks for uh, coming in. And uh, so uh, what's been happening, Chris? You, you, what have you been up to lately, mate? Oh, mate, since I um, retired out of Apex, I kind of keep getting busy, as, as you do. Uh, I think once uh, um, the type of people that, that you and I are, um, we always find something. And the, uh, and the sort of stuff involved. that you found, I mean, the four-wheel drive club, tell us a little bit about that, how you got into that. Yeah, so the, the four-wheel drive, I've always been, had four-wheel drives, or I've had them for you know 20 plus years, and so I've um, you know, enjoyed my camping and, and going out, and as, as we did you know, with in some of the Apex days and, and going out on trips, and uh, when, we, when I um, retired out of Apex and we kind of looked around and, and thought, you know, I wouldn't mind joining a club and... Uh, and finding, you know, going out with some other people and learning a bit more about it. So I um, uh, had a look around, I, you know, jumped on the web as you do and found the Brisbane Four Wheel Drive Club, which oddly enough actually meets pretty much next door to you here. At the uh, Eddie Castle. Yeah, at the Edinburgh Castle Hotel here in Kedron. Yeah, so often, not often, but sometimes we go over there for lunch, I guess, in a couple of years occasionally when something, when something happens. But so the Four Wheel Drive Club... Uh, and uh, that's obviously a fairly big group. How many how many so we would meet there, Chris? Yeah, so the club's got uh, it's got it's a funny sort of thing with members and memberships. So yeah. because they're family members, but there's at any given meeting there's probably about fifty odd people there. Yeah. Um, uh, some of our big events we've had up to ninety people uh, yeah. in there. Wow. Uh, there's just on a it's probably between 100 and 120 members uh, in mm. the club uh, is what I understand mm. uh, from from looking through the list. Excellent. Uh, and the other, the other thing that uh, I've seen you've sort of been actively involved in the last couple of years, this uh, new thing, th- thing called pits and giggles and cooking barbecues and going into barbecue cooking competitions. How did that come about? How have you found the whole process? Tell me what sort of got you into this. So uh, the, um, the idea of uh, you know, cooking and cooking on barbecues and stuff is something we've always done. Um, usually it tends to be you know, bucket loads of sausages. And, but uh, when I um, went along to one of those barbecue competition uh, things at the R&A uh, and had a look around, I thought, oh, this looks pretty cool. And uh, my, you know, then fairly new son-in-law uh, was telling Little me all James. about it. Yeah, James. Uh, was uh, sort of showing me bits and pieces and taught me how to use my Weber properly. I was just about to get rid of my Weber. Um, I've now got seven. <laughs> so... Uh, Seven Webbers. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, that's uh, small compared to a lot of people. I know people have got anything up to 50. So, um, you yeah, know, got the whole range because they've yeah. been around for so long. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, so took the competition and then I, um, one of James's best mates, Rory. Um, yeah, big old he, Rory, He yeah. and I sort of met up while James was over, James and Dee were overseas and uh, went along to um, the the next year's comp at, um, uh, in, the, in the city there, in the R&A. And uh, sort of had a bit of chat about it. We thought oh, we could do this, and so we we sent a message to Jove and said, "By the way, you're now in a barbecue com- barbecue team with Rory and I. And uh, as soon as you get back, we're going to start competing." So we had our start first competing. <laughs> wow! So that must throw you in the deep end because uh, obviously you just you decided you guys have got you had something you wanted to go out there and and test test your uh, uh, ways of doing things against the competition. And what I guess what did you find early on in those competitions? How many competitions have been in? So we've now been in. Probably about a, a dozen, maybe a couple more. And uh, what we found initially was we took far too much gear in, um, and we uh, we made it very difficult for ourselves. So we, it's, uh, it took us probably about four comps to start simplifying stuff and to, to start understanding the process a bit better. Um, and what we've sort of found now is that it's it really is about practice um, and consistency, uh, as it is with any. You know any sort of good business practice or, or anything. If you can be, you know, consistent in your approach and uh, and, and be, be know what you're doing and be good at what you're doing, then you'll succeed. And mm. we're, that's what we're working on now. Certainly enjoying it from what we see. All the Facebook and uh, Instagram posts that get shared uh, from the Pits and Giggles group. Uh, so it's certainly, um, what what do you, what's your favourite uh, type of protein that you to cook and to eat? Right, well, too. Um, uh, the hardest one to cook is the brisket. That's kind of the the king of barbecue, um, mostly because it's uh, 
but every brisket's a little bit different. Uh, and it's a generally you're cooking a piece of meat that's between six and eight kilos. So the, to try and get that consistently good is the most difficult one. Plus, it, I mean, you're looking at um, you know anything up between sort of eight and thirteen hours of cooking. So. Uh, to get that timing right uh, can be very difficult. Um, but it's not necessarily my favourite one to eat. It's just the, the most difficult one. It's the most uh, rewarding one to get right because of the difficulty level. Mm. Um, to eat, I actually really like um, lamb ribs, uh, my new found thing. I've only found them in the last few months and uh, really enjoying them. Um, so they're, uh, they're a bit quicker to cook, so they you can cook them at home without too much trouble they're only about three hours three or four hours to cook where like pork ribs i did pork ribs last night uh, as a Mm. bit of a practice run and for some dinner Uh, and pork ribs you're looking at five or six hours so um, to be able to get something out in three that you can can eat is 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 pretty good Uh, that's as far as competition meals my favorite thing to to eat and cook is reverse seared steak which is kind of a slow cooked steak but it's uh it's pretty magic and, and pretty good that's kind of my signature dish. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know how much I love food. I like, I like um, eating food as much as anybody, and especially all the different types of proteins that you can have. And you, you obviously do chicken, and you do all the all the pulled pork, the different varieties of beef, and uh, it's just quite amazing to see all the different creations. So, if uh, to shout out to a plug to the pits and giggles, what's the um, what are the best ways to get in contact and have a look at the different? So, things going probably on? the easiest way is to uh, look us up on Facebook, um, where. Uh, at Pits and Giggles, so the the and is the the ampersand and, uh, which is well, I think that's above about the se- six or seven on your keyboard. So that little ampersand, uh, so it's Pits seven, and, yeah. Pits and Giggles. Um, so you look look that up on Facebook, and we're, we're pretty easy to find. You'll, um, there's one or two Pits and Giggles around the place, but we're the only ones located in Brisbane. So yeah, and you've got an Instagram page as well. Yeah, you? Instagram page, same thing. At yeah. Pits Giggles, there's no and in that. Um, in the uh, Instagram version, because of the uh, yep. the way the the way their characters work. But so you think you'll be doing this uh, this type of competition from years to come? Do you think? Uh, yeah, we'll be doing it for a while. We've um, it's uh, until it either becomes you know too too expensive or too tiresome where we we're not enjoying it anymore. Yeah, it's, we're like doing it for fun. Yeah. We're doing it. It's a it's a great way to get a few mates together and yeah uh, and go out. And it's a it's a nice scene. The people who do it, you know, the other teams, uh, you know bit of fun and easy to get on with so we've made some really good friends through it um and uh you have got some good sponsors who work well with us uh, who've become mates as well so uh yeah it's a it's a great little setup yeah i guess the only final sort of thing on this is with all the other teams in the competitions that you have and stuff like that do you do you see a lot lot of uh, collaboration happening or does everyone sort of fairly secretive as to how they get things right do they share much of their experience to you like a lot of other things that happen in life there are some that that do that are you know quite insular about it but um you know 90 percent 95 percent um, you go up and you, you talk to them. They'll show you tricks and tips. And yeah, okay. Some so of them can be a little bit yeah. a little bit secretive about you know specific recipes and of sauces and stuff like that. But most of them are you know you'll you can see what stuff they're using and they'll chat mm. with you and um, but a lot of little tips and tricks like learning how to trim mm. trim some of the stuff and and things which is a bit of a challenge. Mm. Um, yeah, there's some always someone around to help or if you need gear, there's always someone who'll lend it to you and mm. yeah, so it's good. Yeah, probably a little bit of a different order to how we usually do most of the podcasts, but I thought I'd go to those because they're nice sort of topics that we've yeah. sort of seen in recent years. Um, I mean, I obviously know quite a bit about your background, where you came from, but but just to share with the listeners, whereabouts were you? Where, whereabouts did you um, brought up, and what was sort of life like as a as a kid? So I I grew up here in Brisbane, uh, over in Newmarket. Uh, it was where I where I grew up. Uh, so only child. Um, so, uh, but I was uh, adopted, which was an interesting kind of thing. Yeah, but I always knew, so it yep. doesn't worry me at all. Um, yeah, good family, uh, some really good um, extended family, uh, which have always been good. Um, my parents split, as seems to be the go with yep. so many uh, these days. They split up as I was uh, uh, t- going through year ten. Mm. Uh, so when I finished year ten, um, I went with mum and moved down to. A little farm just outside of Byron Bay, which was a bit of a culture shock from a private school in Brisbane to Mullumbimby High School. Yeah. Um, but uh, they say things happen for a reason, and I actually met uh, my wife Ruth um, at the at school uh, in Mullumbimby, and um, 
uh, hooked up for our first kiss at a blue light disco in grade 11 and have basically been together ever since. Definitely a very cl- um, close-knit couple, always will be. Um, but, yeah, I love Rufy. She's she's a champion. Um, and then you lived, <coughs> you lived some of your early days in Warwick as well. Yeah, so after, um, after high school, I came back to Brisbane, went to uni. Um, so... Uh, did a Bachelor of Science in IT uh, at university and uh, then moved down to the Gold Coast for a year. It was my first job out of uni um, and then moved out to Warwick and, and was working at TAFE for a number of years uh, in Warwick. My grandparents and aunties lived out in Warwick, so a bit of extended family out there, so that's how I ended up out there. I saw the job and had somewhere to stay because um, my grandparents owned a pub and my grandmother owned a pub in Warwick, so... Living in the pub's a bit of an interesting thing well, <laughs> as well. I'm not sure I knew that one. Yeah, uh, mm. well, because mm. we had the pub, when I was actually at uni, I used to go out and work um, in the holidays at an abattoir out there and lived in the pub while I was there. But, yeah, so we moved out there and, and we were out of Warwick for 10 years. Uh, great little place, really nice place to bring kids up. Um, very friendly uh, overall. And because we you know, because we had the, a business in town, like most you know, small towns, the businesses are very close. Yeah, uh, and so you you tend to be reasonably well. You know all people around town, yep. and you get yep. things like the, you know, the shop will ring one of the the menswear shop will ring you up and say, look, we've got this new stuff in. If you're interested, mm-hmm. uh, we can keep some out for you, and they let you take it home to try it on, and because yeah. <laughs> they know you. So yeah, it was a, it was really nice. Uh, um, just um, the other thing too, what I think the sports that I remember you spoke talking about. Um, in your sort of younger years, weightlifting and also NFL football or gridiron? Yeah, when I was down the coast, uh, the sort of the little period I was down the coast, I um, was looking for something to take some frustration and stuff out on because I'd sort of finished uni and uh, starting into a desk job and so looking for something to do. And one of the guys I was uh, hanging around with or I knew down there um, was playing uh, NFL or playing gridiron. So off we went to the Gold Coast uh, the, sort of the Gold Coast Sharks um, gridiron and went and put the pads on and got just the, you wear all those pads but you don't realise just how bruised you get the first night of full contact oh. it took me probably two days to get over it it was brutal so I played two seasons down there I played the first season while I was down there and then after I moved to Warwick I was still driving backwards and forwards and played a, played a second season but it was too far to go yeah. so uh, so I ended up giving that up. But then when I moved to Warwick, one of the teachers at TAFE that I was working with um, was a, uh, a sort of a retired champion powerlifter. So he got some funding or some help through TAFE to, buy, to, to set up a gym at the TAFE College and uh, had some of the right equipment. So I got into to powerlifting there and was um, a state champion for my, for my weight at the time, uh, which was fairly heavy, like 140 kilo plus. Yeah. Um, but it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it was a it was a bit of fun, very bit mm. of fitness. Um, yeah, I was extremely strong, obviously at yeah. the time. Yeah. So, and obviously, how we met, met obviously is through um, Apex and the Sandgate Apex Club. Uh, we both used to be uh, part of that club uh, going back. And you'd be, what was your first experience in Apex? How did you sort of first get involved? Well, it was that when I was at the TAFE College, and one of the um, one of the other, one of the women who worked in the TAFE College, her husband used to come in and come to the gym as well, uh, and he used to train with us. And so we got chatting and got, and because you know the people you work with, you tend to be mates with. So uh, I got to know David, and, David and Donna Angel uh, was, and David was a, uh, you know, he was in the Apex Club at the time. And but as we were chatting with different things, it was you know he'd talk about, oh no, we're off this weekend, we're doing such and such with Apex, and this is happening with Apex. And after a little while, and I said to him, and I said, look. You know, has it occurred to you to ask me along to this thing? And he sort of went, oh, no, I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> so uh, he took me along um, and I duly joined. And that was in uh, 1994. Uh, I know it's because I got married <laughs> about a month and a half before. So it's easy to, to remember uh, when I joined. And, um, yeah, I just absolutely loved it. Uh, really got into it and found it was a... Um, uh, it worked exceptionally well for yeah. me. It was a nice way to give back to your community. Uh, and I learnt an enormous amount through it. I was going to say, definitely um, myself, but obviously you, you, you would have learnt so much uh, and you developed your skills so well, Chris, um, over those years in Apex. Um, public speaking, you were you know, an exceptional public speaker. 
um, very good at debating, excellent, exceptional probably, um, and being able to sort of lead. Um, when did you sort of first get into, I guess, some leadership skills in Apex? How far down the track? So it was st- probably, um, I found, I mean, as a, as a person, like as a mm. person growing up, because um, I was always kind of the fat kid growing up, so yeah, you know, self confidence not great. No, uh, but you get. In, I got into Apex, and um, the people there were really supportive, and I felt really comfortable there. So I was able to, uh, you know, able to just not worry about that and focus on other stuff. So there were some really cool projects and things happening, and I was keen to learn a lot more about project management. So I thought, well, the best way to learn is to dive in and have a go. And, um, and that's one of the, the great things Apex can do for you is you can learn all these kind of management skills, working with volunteers and, and doing stuff in that in that environment. And you've got mentors and people who'll who'll talk you through it and help you through it, as I've done with you, yeah. uh, on a number of occasions. And then, um, so you just learn all these things, and they're they're things that are so applicable to mm. your business life. Uh, and yeah, that's one of the things I found. Yeah, definitely. I mean. Um, lot, yeah, a couple of different, few different Apex clubs like both of us have been in as well. But uh, and then obviously the aspiration to sort of not only sort of lead clubs, but then lead um, you know districts and states, and and then obviously be, become the national president. Uh, you obviously achieved quite a lot as an as an Apex in life membership as well. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty extraordinary um, your your uh, career in Apex, and it's something that you know. Like a lot of Apex sins, I mean, I look up to that and uh, what you've achieved and uh, certainly learned a lot from you and, and being your treasurer in that first time I was the treasurer for Apex Queensland is something I'll always remember. You really um, turned a, a... We had a really great uh, board that particular year, that first year uh, in particular. It was fairly... Work, I mean, I think that what we you set out to achieve, I think we, we did achieve. There's always going to be loss of members in Apex. We yeah. always found that. Um, it was it was never never easy to sort of solve that particular part of the problem. But uh, what, I guess what's your sort of take as to why the sort of Apex membership's always been an issue uh, ever since the nineties? I think part of the problem that uh, Apex has had is that is it's got a, a strong view of itself um, and of what it thinks. You know what Apex thinks it is and what clubs think think thinks more what clubs think it is that they do and. They're focused, I think, clubs are focused a little bit too much on trying to fundraise and do service jobs, and they forget that the reason that Apex was created and what the best part of Apex is, is what we were just talking about, which is the stuff that you learn. Yes. And when Apex was first started, it was actually started by guys who couldn't join Rotary uh, because they were all architects, and of course Rotary only took one person from each profession so um, there was Mm. these three young guys who were all architects and they weren't allowed to join the Rotary Club so they decided to form their own club and it was the Young Businessmen's Club uh, of Geelong which later then became Apex and how they recruited early was they actually went to the people who were in the Rotary Club and basically said look you're the young men that are in your organisations if you why don't you get them involved in Apex to learn the skills that you've learned by being in a service club? So, uh, because they couldn't join the Rotary Club because their boss was in it, so they already had the person in that profession. So, all of the Rotary Clubs um, actually then recruited people, uh, helped recruit people into Apex Clubs. So, Apex Club was kind of this it really was originally a junior rotary and then later on it sort of moved more towards junior lions uh, as it went on and it was that during that phase particularly in the 80s when they they had this massive population growth where it was about more about bums on seats than about what they were doing and with apex with apex mm. yeah there was they were just trying to you know it was all about getting the numbers in um, and the whole demographic changed with it and it became this thing that was completely focused on trying to raise big money for service events and big money to put into you know a million dollars to uh, for mm. um, hospital in Sydney and a million dollars for cancer mm. research and these kinds of things and once they uh, at that point they started to lose their focus of what Apex was originally about, which is you use 
yes, you'd absolutely do the fundraising, you do great service work and things, but you use that as a means by, uh, it's a means rather than the end. Yep. So the end is actually to train these young people and you get them in and you teach them and then you, you know, and then they go on and are better in business and they will often join Rotary Clubs and do other things, but they'll become, you know, some of the strongest citizens in, in a, um, uh, in a um, town uh, and, you know, become very well known and uh, and does a great job for them. But when they started to just become fundraisers, they they lost that uh, and they basically lost the plot a lot from that point. Uh, and kind of as much as we've tried to, you know, those of us in the leader position, leadership positions have tried to, re, you know, re-steer the ship, um, there's just too much embedded... Uh, you know, idealism in this idea that you've got to do service, you've got to raise funds, you have to do this. Uh, and they've kind of lost that training aspect a bit. Mm. I mean, I think that one of the most important parts of Apex is the social aspect of Apex. Um, mm. uh, the friends that you make is obviously a big one, but, uh, but um, uh, yeah, so that to me is one of the big things that you get. Obviously, the friendship, everyone in Apex should really be a friend. Um, and I, and I think um, that's that's certainly um, you know one of the main things I got out of Apex, but obviously developing the skills as we said. But uh, what do you think about some of the best sort of um, what are what are some of the best things like the best convention you ever went to, for example? Oh, well, that's you were talking about the friends, and there's a sort of a saying in you know in a different yes. areas, but long you know, well used in Apex that there's no strangers; it's just friends you haven't met yet. Um, in the apex world uh, and I found that certainly in my traveling around and, and and that was one of the reasons I kept sort of going up the levels and doing stuff is one I thought I could make a difference uh, and two it was just the people I met uh, so I went to a lot of conventions over time because I went to state conventions in every state uh, so I've been to you know been to all of them um, uh, as well as quite a few national conventions uh, weirdly, the two most memorable conventions uh, I've got, um, one would be the national convention um, that you were at, the Ginger Ninjas. That and was at uh, yeah, Ballarat. Yeah, the Ballarat National Convention in what, that was 2007? 2007. Yeah, 2007. Um, or was it 2008? And that was, as 2007, a national convention, yeah. that was my favourite one, and it was because of that camaraderie of that group and how tight the, our, our state board was you know and we all you know we wanted to stand out as Queenslanders and I'd worked I think you did that. I'd worked yeah. exceptionally hard to get that team or to get that group of quite disparate individuals mm. into a really cohesive team and they disagreed on things but they could disagree and argue but still be a united front yep. um, and you know the, the stupid thing where we you know all bleached our hair very badly, I might add, which seems like a you know, completely ridiculous thing to do. But the day we were in there doing that, uh, where we all bleached our hair, we're sitting there getting our hair done by each other. So all these blokes in there bleaching our own hair with no idea what we're doing, we're just working off the instructions. But at the same time, we were going through all of the motions and budgets and stuff. So we were discussing all this business while we're all sitting there with this bleach in our hair. It was just it was the single my most memorable day that I've got um, in Apex. So it well, was definitely big. a highlight. I think one of the other highlights, obviously, when you uh, when the club surprised you, you, um, you only just turned forty two, uh, and you got your life membership, and you also became the national president on the same day. Yeah, that was a big night. Uh, so that was a, a very big night. It was was because I was um, being uh, uh, going through the process of, or the you know, the ceremony for becoming national president, um, and you know, before we even got to that. Uh, the the club awarded me uh, a life membership and you know gave me the great honour uh, of becoming a life member of the club and a f- the first life member uh, of our club. So it was a so that's um, the uh, Brisbane City Apex the, club, yeah, the which uh, still still uh, trooping on at the moment. That's what uh, obviously the Apex club that we've sort of kept going now, and uh, we've got about 10, yeah. 10 members still at the moment. So. Uh, but that that was actually founded by yourself. Uh, I think maybe Sam Russell, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Sam, yeah Sam Russell and Brett Doig and I were yeah. basically the yeah. the three people who put it together. We were all members of the Sandgate Club, um, and the Sandgate Club was going through a few hassles. Yeah. Uh, and plus, all of us were kind of living 
more towards the south side. Um, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I was working at St Lucia and, and we just decided we'd have something a bit closer into the city. So we, um, yeah, started up the – decided to start up a new club. Sandgate had uh, – I think it had – about 30 members at one the time. stage it was yeah 25 when i joined and uh yeah so it, it was cracking 40 there at one point oh really yeah, yeah. Wow. so the um yeah so there was a, a there was enough you know numbers to do it that a few of us could go um and we, yeah so we started up the new club and it um and it's still kicking along so so that's good and it was like we started in 2002 so it's been you know going for more than 15 years now so we're pretty proud about that I think we're up to about 333 um, meetings or something. So yeah. we're sort of getting there uh, with that, um, you know, all of that. Yeah, it's quite amazing. But uh, what are, I guess, some of the favourite... What, what do you think the most memorable service event, I guess, that you participated in in Apex? Service events are hard because they can be memorable for different things. So, uh, like, when I was back in the Warwick uh, days... And we used to run a barbecue stall at the Warwick Rodeo, which was uh, at the time the biggest rodeo in the country. So we would do we were doing steak burgers, sausages, and chips. And with steak burgers, sausages, and chips, we took over seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> so a very good effort. Yeah, in two and a half days. <laughs> so that's a lot of steak burger, sausages, and chips. You know, it, you know. Three dollars a burger and dollar fifty a sausage. That's a, a lot going on. Uh, so, from a you know organisational perspective, I actually that was probably where I learnt that project management stuff I was talking about earlier. Was doing the barbecues there because they were pretty yeah. big. So from that kind of perspective, that was probably the the best one from a sheer enjoyment and for what it achieved. Um, I did the posty bike ride in South Australia. Yeah, that's that's looked like a really good project. Uh, yeah, it's a it's. Um, not only is it a fun thing to be a part of, uh, it's Apex actually getting in and decided they wanted to fundraise for something themselves. So they've created or have built a number of um, uh, uh, holiday homes um, in uh, in near Kadena. I can't remember the actual town. They're in, they're in the coastal town near Kadena. And they, um, they've built three of the four that they wanted to achieve. Uh, and all raised, you know, all done with funds raised from these posty bike rides. So the posty bike ride is basically it's about five days, uh, and you ride posty bikes for about nine hundred kilometres, um, pretty much all off road, including a big chunk that's usually sandy desert wow, kind of area. That sounds like that sounds really fun. So it was amazing, and, for, and but, to see these, but, uh, and a sense of achievement as well. Yeah, to 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 see these things eventuate, uh, and mm. you know they're coordinated by the local club but they've uh, entrusted the the actual asset to the apex foundation yep. um, to make sure that there's continuity mm -hmm. there so that there's continuity of the the asset but the local clubs still do the fundraising and still yep. you know work in it so it's um uh, it's it was very very well thought out and a, and a really good project so that's probably the best project that i've actually in my time in apex that i've uh, seen run by anyone and it's still running so I think it's a you know a sensational project Excellent, probably haven't got too much time, I'm going to have to do part two at some stage Chris, because yeah. I, know, I know there's lots of things we can certainly certainly talk about uh, all the different things that we've sort of been going through here but uh, um, I guess the, probably the final thing we could probably talk about uh, uh, tonight is I guess, who, who are some of the people that you looked up to as a, when, who, you know, the inspirations in your life, the men the people that, uh, you know, mentors? So during a, a... I mean, most of them have come from my Apex career uh, and working in there um, because they're... Uh, while it's one thing to sort of uh, look at people who are, you know, semi-celebrity, whether they... You know, however that sits, you know, the, the Elon Musks, these wells, that that type of thing. Uh, although I'm a bit old for, <laughs> for him to have been uh, in my formative time. Um uh, it, in the Apex world, it was people like um, Andrew Phillips, who was the GM uh, of Apex at the time, and um, uh, his had, he had one of the one of the best public speakers I've seen in, in Apex, and delivered a sensational speech and very um, very motivational. Uh, and just for watching someone just get in and work and just keep working would probably be um, uh, now I can't remember, remember his name on the. Foundation on the camp board, Mark. 
Mark. Uh, ex copper. Uh, Mark Ballin. Mark Ballin. God, don't you hate him? It's, it's this turning 50 thing. My, Brian's going to watch. No, Mark <laughs> Ballin. Of <laughs> all the people I couldn't, yeah, I like couldn't remember Ballin. his name. Mark um, Ballin I've known for a long time. He's yeah, so Mark Ballin's a, a life member of the association and has been a member of a number of clubs and has been retired for some 20 years but still puts in just massive amounts of effort into helping local clubs around his area as well mm. as still being, you know, doing some stuff with foundation and doing stuff mm. with the camp. And, yeah, mm. so, and he, was, um, he was always a really good sounding board uh, because uh, one of the things about Mark is there is no bullshit with Mark. Yeah. <laughs> he says what he thinks and he thinks what he says and he'll stand by it. So yeah, excellent. Um, as, as someone to bounce things off and to talk, talk with about things, <coughs> uh, yeah, it was, he's hard to beat. Mm. No, I think we have to wrap that up, uh, unfortunately. But uh, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, Chris. I know we'll come and talk a bit more, and uh, I'll sort of uh, have a few more things we can talk about, I'm sure. Thank you again. Have a great Easter, mate, and uh, look forward to catching up soon. Sounds good, mate. Thanks a lot for having me along. No worries. Thanks. Cheers, mate.